Almighty Father, we thank you so very much for the gift of another day. Thank you for the turn of another year. When your children, the fellowship of young Christian adults can uh, celebrate your faithfulness again, Lord, take the place in the name of Jesus. Immortal King of Glory, we thank you for the way you began with us in the course of the week, the way you've been dishing out instructions to us, even from your holy scriptures. Take the praise in Jesus' name. Lord, as we round off this anniversary this year, we pray, Lord, much more than you've done in the course of the week, you'll do today in the name of Jesus. Divine Master, as I bring your word, I pray you grant me utterance in the name of Jesus. Help me to speak your mind alone. I pray the spirit that seeks to impress human beings will not prosper in the name of Jesus. But your Holy Spirit that expresses your mind to men will have its way in the name of Jesus. Lord, in essence, you are the one we want to see. You are the one we want to hear. Lord, please reveal yourself to us. Thank you, faithful Father. In Jesus' mighty name we pray it. Amen. Please, can the amen be louder than that? Amen. Thank you so very much. When I had the opportunity to minister amongst uh, young ones on Thursday, we began to look at the theme for this year's anniversary. And the theme is followers of Christ. God gave us the opportunity to have an understanding from the scriptures as uh, so he unraveled to us some mysteries about followership. And then that concept came out a little clearer to us. And the foundation was laid that Thursday. I can't go through a summary of what we, do, uh, we did on Thursday in its entirety. But I'll mention just a few things. Uh, taking a foundation from the text we read, Matthew chapter 4 from verse 18 to 22. In the earlier part of this service... We saw Jesus walking by the coastline and he came across Peter and Andrew. That's verse 18. And he made a call unto them to follow him. The Bible says they left their nets and followed him. He moved a little distance after that and they met James and John, both sons of Zebedee. They were together with their father fishing. He made the same call, follow me. And the Bible says they left their nets and their father and followed Jesus. And then that Thursday, we began to ask that what is true followership? And we took it from what following Jesus is not. What following Jesus is not. And we saw that following Jesus is not merely attending the church. It's not bearing uh, a Christian name, as we say, or an Hebrew name. It's not bearing Tolua Nemi, Ulua Leshe, Ulua Lagbara, or any other name like that. It's not belonging to a church unit. We saw that, above all, it's not even saying Jesus is Lord. And that was a shocker, but we had to explain. Not merely saying Jesus is Lord. That's not following Jesus. Because he said, many will say to me, Lord, Lord. And on that day, we say, I do not know you. So we asked what then is true followership when it comes to following Jesus? And in that service, we're able to see five things. Number one is confessing Jesus as Lord. Number two is obeying Jesus. Number three is leaving some things behind because of Jesus. Number four is spending time with him. And five, becoming like him. Those are the five things we looked at, at uh, for close to two hours that day. So obviously we cannot go into details this morning. We are moving a little step further this morning. I pray God will give us understanding in the name of Jesus. Remember we said again that Peter and Andrew were part of those Jesus called when he was moving by that coastline that day. He made a call on them and they followed but it turns out that Jesus, I mean Peter, turned out to be about the foremost out of those he called that day. Foremost. And obviously you know that that is very true. You remember I was called that day. And then in the course of Jesus' ministry, there was a day they were in the sheep and Jesus was walking on water. You remember that account very well. It was late in the evening. 
The Bible lets us know that they were afraid. And Jesus told them, do not be afraid. I am the one. One of them spoke out, if you are the one, bid me to come on the water to meet you. Who was that person? It was Peter. And Jesus bid him to come. You know the end of the story? He began to sink. But then Jesus helped him to keep afloat. And you remember the account of when Jesus asked his disciples, whom do men say I am? And they began to answer. Some say you are Elias, you are John the Baptist, you are Jeremiah, or you are one of the other prophets. They gave all manner of answers. Jesus waited. He bided his time for the right answer. The right answer did not come until Peter spoke. He said, you are Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus looked at him. You have answered correctly. They called you Simon, either two. And uh, you bear the name Peter. But today I prefer to call you Peter because you are the rock. So Peter turned out to be a foremost out of all these people, the disciples that followed Jesus. You remember when Jesus went to the Mount of Transfiguration? It took three disciples, Peter, James, and John. They had a wonderful time there. When it was time for them to return, I guess, one of them spoke, no, no, we are not going back. Let us tarry here and remain here. And we are even going to make tabernacles, three of them, for you, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Who was the person that spoke again? It was Peter. So he had become so close to Jesus that he could speak on behalf of the others. Even when it was time for Jesus to be crucified, he went to the Garden of Gethsemane. He went with three out of the disciples, of the uh, twelve disciples. Peter was one of them. James was one of them. John was one of them. But then something happened. When it was the night before Jesus would be crucified, you remember some soldiers came to arrest him. And one of them so loved Jesus that he drew his sword and cut off the ear of one of the servants who came to arrest Jesus. And the name of the servant was Malchus. Who was that disciple again? It was Brother Peter. He loved Jesus so much he was ready to fight for him. But Jesus told him, sorry, God sent me to the world to fulfill a divine purpose. You know quite well that what Jesus came to act out was a drama divinely scripted by God Almighty. That's why the Bible keeps saying that all scriptures might be fulfilled. So I'm a drama minister. I understand very well that my Lord Jesus came to act out a drama. The only thing about his own drama, making it different from our own. When we do our own drama and somebody has to die, the person doesn't die really. <laughs> you find the person dying in the movie and you see him the following day. But for Jesus, he actually died. So Jesus told John, I mean Peter, that sorry, cutting off somebody's ear is not part of the script my father wrote. So you have to return the ear to the owner. But the person that was so concerned about Jesus again there was Peter. And then one day, Jesus gathered them. He said, this night, you'll be offended of me. you run away from me. And I think the right thing for any right-thinking man to do is to kneel down and say, Father, you said we'll run away from you. We know you can never tell a lie. Help us that we might not run away. Help us that we we'll remain true to the end. Help us to continue to follow you to the very end. He was speaking to his followers, his close disciples, and he said, you'll be offended of me. You'll scatter, you'll run away. Because the shepherd will be smitten. The sheep will run away. Instead of them to start praying, Peter did not allow that to happen. He said, even if everybody runs away, I will not run away. That is overconfidence. And overconfidence is the bane of many followers of Christ. When you come to a point you are so overconfident, nothing, I cannot backslide. Nothing can happen. What intelligence would you know for that? Then that is the recipe, correct recipe for backsliding. We need to keep praying for grace. This man did not pray for grace. He did not ask for mercy. He responded the master. Even if all of them will run away, I will not run away. And Jesus said, he repeated it. That tonight, I say, you will abandon me because something is going to happen. Waiting for them to cry for mercy again, 
Peter said, and he improved on what he said the first time. If it comes to dying, I am ready to die. Master, I'm following you. I can never turn back. What will draw me away from you? And Jesus now shifted his gaze and looked at Peter squarely. That what I had said either to was for everybody, but this is for you, Peter. That before the cock crows, even once tonight, you will deny me three times. And this man, the Bible did not record that he begged for mercy. He must have said, you ruined me, somebody like me. And that's the way some people are. I've been born again 45 years. Before you were born, I've been in Christ. So what will make me turn back? I look at them and I say, wow. What you need is cry for mercy. Cry for grace. And then indeed, you know what happened that night. When you look at that account in Matthew chapter 26, you find from verse 69 to 74, then we'll look at verse 75 before we round off this morning. Actually, there the Bible, please can you have me, let me have that on the screen. Matthew 26 verse 58, the night Jesus was arrested. Let us see what Peter did. But Peter followed him at what? At a distance so the high priest caught yet and he went in and sat with the servants to see the end the one that said nothing can happen to the lord jesus i'm ready to fight for you to the end now he followed at a distance the king james says he followed afar off and he stayed in the outer part of the courtyard to see the end the end of what? The end of the matter. The end of what? The end of Jesus. The end of what? How? Oh, Jesus will die a miserable death. Let me see where this one will result in. So the one that was a close follower of Jesus, Abenuboro, you understand me? The mouthpiece, the talk active, the audacious, the one who could speak when none else was willing to speak, now was following afar off. And I think what he was saying in his heart was only a gima bati mije ikunimuru. Yeah. That's where the one God called. You are the one God sent. You just met me by the riverside, JJ, and you said, Follow me. I followed you as far as I could. Now he was following him afar off. Peter of all people. Peter of all people. Following afar off. So, beloved, we have people that are still in church, but they are afar off. They come to church so that no one will come to meet from the visitation department at the end of the service and they begin to see me as a backslider. Let me just go. That they will not bother me. I'm far off. Your prayer life used to be very, very strong, very deep, very good. But it's no longer so. It is a far off. Well, you used to study the Bible. I repeat, I mean, hear me again. When you used to study the Bible, Whenever you open the pages of the Bible, revelations will come. You receive personal instructions. But that doesn't happen again. Or perhaps you no longer study the Bible afar off. You used to come to church to worship God. You love fellowshipping with other brethren. But now it is a burden. You are keeping away from fellowship. When you manage to come, you come late. When you don't come at all, you stay at home and you wait for the church to ask after you. When they don't ask after you, you're complaining with you. You see, there is no love in that church. You, that should be a senior member in the visitation department, checking after young believers. Now, you stay home and you complain. They don't check on people in that church. Afar off. Of course, Brother Mike is not saying we should not check on one another, but we should have grown, have grown this level. Personal evangelism, you can't enter a vehicle without telling people about Jesus. You can't stay in the airport seated waiting for the flight to start. I mean, to be announced without telling people about Jesus. But now it's just all about you alone. Afar off. But then the question is, and that's just about what we'll be looking at this morning. Why do close followers of Jesus become afar off followers? Or altogether, why do they stop following Jesus? And we're looking about three, four, or five of them. Let's see how far we can go because of time. If you are still here, can you say amen, please? Amen. If you are learning a thing or the other, can you say bigger amen? amen? Thank you so very much. Why do people quit following Jesus or draw far from Jesus? Number one, prevalence of sin. Prevalence of sin. 
when sin becomes prevalent the bible says in matthew 24 verse 12 because iniquity shall abound the love of many will do what will wax cold matthew 24 12 because iniquity shall abound the love of many shall wax cold take note the bible did not say the love of all yes the love of many will wax cold but there will always be a remnant so when sin becomes prevalent when iniquity abounds people that used to follow jesus so closely will begin to draw back it is a prophecy of the end times you of course you know matthew 24 well, it's where Jesus highlighted some of the signs of the end of times. And this is one of them. That the love of many will wax cold. Those who used to love God so passionately, they begin to lose the love. The passion reduces. Sin, like some sort of disease in our days, has become so contagious. You need a high dose of spiritual vaccination to be able to maintain your purity. That is the truth. I remember when I was much younger... There, were, there, was, there weren't uh, pornographic materials. They were not rampant at all. I'm talking to our young ones there, here. To see a pornographic material, you only stumble them on shelves, I mean, uh, newspaper stands. And even then, vendors would keep them under other materials. You had to ask for these materials, then they bring them from inside. Pornography was not thing, a thing that people displayed openly. But now you don't need to go to a vendor stand to get pornographic materials. It's right there on your phone. At the click of a button, you are there. So it takes one who is determined that God, I want to stand and remain standing. Because sin is so abundant these days. Things, things that will call you or lure you into sin are all over the place. Everybody wants to become rich quickly. And you see people introducing how to become rich quickly and in very negative ways. You begin to wonder, what am I waiting for? And again, this prevalent amongst youths. You find the daddy riding around a car he bought 10 years ago or 12 years or even 15 years. That is managing this and keeping the vehicle in order to train this young one to school. And you see the young one telling his friends, by the time I get to NYSC, before the end of my NYSC, I want to ride the latest model of Toyota, the one made in the year 2023. We are in 2022. So not even this year's own. The 2023 model is what they want to ride. Why? Because they see young ones like them who are riding big cars and they think it's for, it's for me too. And then the temptation comes and you see some of them enter into things that should not be mentioned. Prevalence of sin. We live in a generation in which uh, purity is denigrated. You denigrate purity and celebrate immorality. Unfortunately, some of our mommies and daddies are not helping here. You see your children going wayward and you can't talk to them. And I keep praying. You know, what God says about Abraham, I love. It says, I trust my servant, Abraham, for he will command his children. Is there in the Bible. The Bible did not say he will beg his children to be righteous. He will instruct, mm -mm. he will command his children. There is a place of command. I do it in my home. Sorry, this cannot go in my home. Go back to the barber's shop and correct this air. And I've done it for my children. They pick from their pocket money to go and correct the air cut. He will command his children. Why can a mother be celebrating a child that is going wayward? Aho Martin DCC. Look at you, looking beautiful and sexy from the mouth of a Christian mother. This is what is happening. I'm talking from experience because I counsel a lot of people. You find young people, how did you end up this way? And she will tell you, mommy never told me it was wrong, not for once. Prevalence of sin. It's all over the place. It's cheap. What did it thorough? Thorough, you can just get it easily. Not like it was when I just became born again. And it was just a few years ago. So we need grace. This generation sees the normal as abnormal. It sees the abnormal as normally normal. For this reason, the love of many is waxing cold. And many have become afar of Christians. Number two, love of the world. Why are people quitting following Jesus? Love of the world. Second Timothy chapter 4 verse 10. You know that very well. For them as had forsaken me, haven't loved this present world, and is departed. And is what? Departed. 
Demas was at one time a very close associate of uh, Paul. There was a time Paul was in prison. He was writing a letter. He said, I, Paul, and Demas send our greetings. That was how close Demas was to Paul. We got a time Paul said of him. He said, for Demas had forsaken me. I haven't loved this present evil world. So the love of the world is one thing that is drawing some people back from following Jesus. The distractions of the world can make you lose interest in the attractions of heaven if you are not in, uh, careful. And as a matter of fact, it is dangerous to allow the pleasure of the station to make you forget your destination. I remember when train was still very, very active in Nigeria. I undertook a number of journeys from Elori to Kaduna. It used to be fun for us. And we stopped on the way, I think Mina or Bida, along the way. I wouldn't know which was the first station. Whenever we stop the train, we berth and wait for us to buy things. You can get out of the train. You can stroll around. Some people will stroll as far as into the town of Mina then to enjoy, buy things. And they keep their ears open for when the on of the train will blare again. Oh then we start running back into the train. And on so many occasions, we see some of our mates, they have gone so far into the town, by the time they return, the train is going. They don't wait. Are you completing your coach? They make it go. And let me tell you, some actually missed their train because they went so far away from the train station. And this is true of some Christians. They've drifted far into worldliness that the voice of the Holy Spirit is no longer sounding in their ears. When the Holy Spirit speaks to them, even through other believers, you know what their language is? I know what I am doing. And I keep telling people when some believers, in quote, tell you, I know what I am doing. Please get closer. And this is part of their language. It doesn't matter. All this thing you are talking about does not really matter. You are the one that is bothering yourself. Christianity is not this difficult. <laughs> Love of the world. And number three. We are looking at just four. Number three, shallow messages. Shallow messages. Messages that lack depth. Shallow messages. The original mandate given to us is as contained in the Great Commission, you know. Mark chapter 16, verse 15. There, the Lord Jesus said, the Bible says, And they said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. This is the mandate the Lord gave to us. This is the Great Commission. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Unfortunately, the Great Commission has either been distorted, adjusted, modified, or abandoned altogether. You find ministers of the gospel now announcing to the world that when God called me, he called me and he said, Son, I commission you this day, go into the world and deliver my people from the shackles of poverty. What manner of call is that? What manner of call is that? But that's what we hear today. Some will tell you, God called me, son, go and teach the world how to be financially rich and wealthy. That's all. No, no. I have every reason to doubt that. This is why we have messages from many people today that are devoid of the gospel. Most sermons are no different from ordinary business seminars. There are no more calls for repentance, no more calls for restitution, no more calls for revival, no more calls for restoration. Just how to make it in life. So when you keep listening to messages like this, obviously your heart will drift far from the master. Shallow messages. So we have many having a form of godliness, but no power as we have in the Bible. And number four, why we have people drifting away from the Lord. We have the mixed multitude. The mixed multitude. Exodus 12, verse 37 to verse 38. Allow me to read that from here. And the children of Israel journeyed from Ramesses to Sukkot, about 600,000 on foot, that were men beside the children. And a mixed multitude went with them. And a mixed multitude went with them. So this mixed multitude, according to the uh, book of Numbers, were the ones who began the complaining in the wilderness that we had 
the garlic, we had the onions, all manner of things. We had cucumber to eat back in Egypt. All we have now is this thing, manna. And the original meaning of manna is, what is this? That's the original meaning, manna. In Yoruba, kilele. That's the name of the food. They never saw it. They had never eaten it. It's the food of angels. God gave to them. They had no nomenclature for it. So that thing appeared strange. What's all this? So it was the children of Egypt, now known as a mixed, of, uh, mixed multitude, that began complaining. And the children of Israel joined them in complaining. So the presence of mixed multitude amongst the children of God, if you don't recognize them, if you don't identify them, if you are not careful of them, they can make you lose interest in following the master. You know, there are many vehicles going to different destinations. When you get to a motor park, you have many people going to different places. You have uh, the touts, you have the driver, the conductors, you have traders, you have orcas, those selling stuffs there. You have well-wishers, those who have come to see others off. You have criminals around there in the motor park. You have aimless people just moving around. You have genuine travelers. So it is only genuine travelers that will enter the vehicle and travel. But listen, there are people that can make you miss your boss if you are not careful. And to them, it will be no pain because they had no intention of traveling in the first place. For instance, if you get to the car park, I mean to the airport, you are traveling Nigeria, all the way from Nigeria to London. And you sit there waiting for your flight to be called. And then you come across a friend who is going from Nigeria to Benin Republic. And you met so many years ago, and you are so happy to see the friend. Ah, ah, Oreo to Jameta, you are welcome. Nice to see you again. Oh, what a wonderful time. And this man's flight is in six hours' time. Yours is barely 20 minutes to go. And you are so happy with this friend, going to Benin Republic in six hours' time, that at the end of the day, you finish greeting him, and you go back to sit down. And you ask people around, have they announced the flight to London? And they tell you the flight left almost 25 minutes ago. When did they announce a flight? Of course, they announced, but you did not hear because you were busy with the mixed multitude. And that's what we say. Talking about the rapture, indeed, the trumpet will sound. And then they miss it. And I pray for us, this will not be our portion in the name of Jesus. Will you permit me to add one? If I don't add this, you do not make it complete. Another way, reason is challenges of life. And just a few minutes after this, we'll pray. Challenges of life. This can make some people start following Jesus from afar off. I'm sure you remember our friend John the Baptist. John the Baptist spoke of the supremacy of Jesus. Matthew chapter 3 verse 11. He spoke of the supremacy of Jesus. He said, this is one. The lace of his shoe... I'm not worthy to lace. That's how high he is. He respected the lordship of Jesus in Matthew 3, 13, 14. When Jesus came to him for baptism, he said, no, you are the one to baptize me. But Jesus said that all scriptures might be fulfilled, that all righteousness might be fulfilled. You baptize me. He respected him so much. He declared the lordship of Jesus again in John 1, 29. He went ahead to baptize Jesus. And right before his eyes, the dove, the spirit of God descended as a dove on the head of Jesus. You remember that? And he heard the voice of God speaking that this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. He heard it. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. So he knew that Jesus actually was the Messiah. But when the challenge came, when he had a problem with King Herod, and King Herod kept him in prison, waiting for the day to behead him, Jesus sent some of his disciples to go and visit him in the prison. And John the Baptist sent a message back to him. He said, let us know once and for all, are you the Messiah? Or you are not the one so that we wait for the real person that is to come. The same person that heard, this is my beloved son in whom I am well placed. When the problem of life came, he had become blind to the reality of Jesus' sonship. Are you the Messiah? Can you imagine that coming out of the mouth of John? So we don't look down on people who face challenges of life. We get close to them. Oh, you are too born again to backslide now. How can you be talking like this now? Yes, there is a loss. Why are you still crying now? And why are you not coming to church? You are not serious now. No, let's get close to them. 
challenges of life can make some otherwise serious minded Christian begin to draw back. Let's get close to them and help them. And at the end, in Matthew 26, verse 75, can I have that scripture? Please, 74, then 75. After our friend Peter had denied Jesus, in verse 24, and he began to curse. You remember, he denied Jesus three ways. The first time, he denied him simply. Number two, he denied with an oath. Number three, he denied, he cursed, and then he swore. He began to curse and to swear, saying, I know not the man. The same Jesus he had professed and confessed. I do not know the man you are talking about. What do you mean by swearing and cursing? Timba monkey, my Jerry or mommy, something like that. A big curse. So somebody can get to that point. Yes, but not somebody like Peter, but it happened to him. And then immediately the cock crew. The crock cock was the alarm of the Holy Spirit. And then what happened in 75, can we say? And Peter remembered. The word of Jesus, which said unto him, Before the cock crowd, thou shalt deny me thrice. And he went out and wept bitterly. And this is the solution to drawing far from Jesus. You return to him. You cry unto him, Lord, I need help. You know the end of the story for Peter? He returned to his status as a foremost disciple of Jesus, a great apostle. He was the first person to preach after the Pentecost, he preached a lengthy message declaring from Genesis to the day he knew about how the Messiah came. He traced everything. He returned to the master and they died in Christ at the end of the day. I pray God will give us the grace to walk close to him and to keep walking with him to the very end. In Jesus' name. Shall we bow our heads to pray? Begin to talk to God. Lord, help me. Mumi dele, Baba, Mumi dele, Kogun weshu mabori mio, Jawa, Mumi dele. The song is saying, God, help me to make it home. Lead me home. Don't allow the hosts of darkness to overcome me. Pray that prayer in another three minutes before I leave the altar. Talk to God. Lord, give me grace. Help me. Uphold me. That you followed Christ for 32 years, 45 years. It's not the story here. It's immaterial. That's the truth. Just talk to God. Help me, Lord. Give me the needed grace. Mumidele Baba Mumidele Kogunweshu Maborimio Jawa Mumidele you are in the house this morning. You know you are following, but you are far off. You cannot deceive yourself. Man of God, I know my state in Christ. I know what my Bible study life used to be like, my prayer life, my evangelism life, my worship life. I know, I know, but I know the way it is now. I know I need help. You need not come to the altar. But please, if you need help in this regard, why don't you just lift up your hand? Spirit of the living God, join your hands to my hand and help me. Lift up that hand. Lift it up. Lord, I need help. I know my spiritual life needs help. Thank you, Spirit of the living God. Father, thank you for your children who are standing now. They understood the call and in humility they responded to the voice of your Holy Spirit. Lord, the help they need, please release upon them. In the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Please, can the entire house stand now as we close for this session? Please, let's stand. Spirit of the living God, we thank you for speaking to us. Thank you for releasing your word and revealing your mind. Be praised in the name of Jesus. We pray these words will remain with us till eternity. Help us not to recover from the impact of what you have dropped in our hearts. But let this message be repeatedly preached by your Holy Spirit so that we can remain true to you to the very end in the name of Jesus. I pray for everyone responding, Amen. We will not get lost on the journey. We will not be missing on that day. Thank you, faithful Father. In Jesus' mighty name we pray it. Amen.